With the rise of hip hop came the overwhelming demand of pop cultural statements and pieces that would go along with it. The birth of the controversial yet revolutionary genre prompted the masses to surrender to the new wave of all things cool and hip. This segueing all the way over to the runways of some of the world's top designers. Top model and Chanel Muse, Kimora Lee Simmons cultivated a revolutionary brand just as revolutionary as the music she take inspiration from. Baby Fat wasn't just a fashion brand worn by the hottest of celebs and their brand in 2019 but a way of life that had expanded into a global sensation by the mid-2000s. From phones to car exteriors to shoes, jewelry, and perfume, Baby Fat by Kimora Lee Simmons was a ghetto fabulous empire that had overshadowed similar brands like it, but as quickly as its popularity rose, by the time Y2K came to an end, so did the brand. So, how did this brand within a brand subsidiary become a pop culture phenomenon, and where did it all go wrong? Russell Simmons, that's where... No, I'm just kidding. However, Russell isn't all that innocent in this whole dynamic. More on that later. Whether you own baby fat gear or reminisce every time you took a whiff of one of Kimora's many fragrances, we all remember the time Baby Fat by Kimora Lee Simmons had the girls and guys in a frenzy. Who would have thought that the idea of being hood rich would make its way to the mainstream stage? Or folks like Paris Hilton and the most uppity of the higher class would partake in the hoopla? Well, as you may have noticed, we've been in that sector of the Matrix for a good minute now, and with the resurgence of Y2K mania brought on by the Gen Z, it looks like we're gonna be in that bubble for a little while longer, but hey, no complaints over here. When Blasian Bay Kimora Lee Simmons met her now ex-husband, founder of Def Jam Recordings hip hop label, Russell Simmons back in 1992, she didn't think the marriage would end. Literally, with her being the founder of one of the most iconic brands to come out of the 2000s. Born Kimora Lee Perkins, the tall, multicultural beaut just knew she was going to be that girl in her preferred career of choice, modeling. When she wasn't studying amongst her classmates at a local high school in St. Louis, Missouri, she was halfway across the country modeling the season's most sought-after designs by its most sought-after designers. With a Japanese-Korean mother and an African-American father, Kimora's distinct features propelled her to the top of fashion designers radar. By the time Kimura was 10, she was already 5 feet 10 inches and had enrolled in modeling classes by the age of 11. Her dad unfortunately went to the store to buy milk and never returned, but that wasn't going to stop Kimura's aspirations. As soon as she reached those pivotal teen years, she'd be discovered by Paris agency Glamour at a model search in Kansas City, and soon after would be known all over the modeling world after designer Karl Lagerfeld chose her to close for one of his hot couture shows dressed as a 13-year-old child bride. By the time when she was just 17, she'd come across entrepreneur and hip-hop pioneer Russell Simmons at New York Fashion Week. Simmons, who also co-founded the famous Def Jam Recordings just eight years prior, got the brilliant ideas to create his own fashion label, inspired by the relatively new hip-hop wave. His own LLC, Fat Fashions, was established in that same year and derived from it came the Fat Farms label. Pioneering some of hip-hop's most recognized staples, Simmons obviously knew what he was doing. Kimora, on the other hand, would be swept off her feet by Simmons bald-headed charm, and soon enough, the two had begun dating. It didn't matter that Kimura was a wee minor barely scraping the surface of legal years and Simmons 20 years her senior, right? Fat Farm became a major success in the fashion world, mainly amongst its base supporters, the hip-hop community, and the fans that supported it. After tying the knot in 1998, Kimora Lee Perkins transformed into Kimora Lee Simmons, and her days as Karl Lagerfeld's rotary muse would be transformed into a CEO and creative director of her own fashion brand. Baby Fat by Kimora Lee Simmons was born in 1999, just one year before the birth of her actual baby, Ming Lee. In the meantime, Baby Fat was Kimora's main responsibility. With Russell giving the fellas their own casual luxury brand, Kimora set out to do the same thing, creating a women's fashion line within Fat Fashion's corridors. Fat Fashion's was established as a business entity created primarily to operate the men's streetwear label, Fat Farm, but what was initially launched as an extension of Fat Farm not only took over the Fat Farm label, but the world of fashion altogether. A prototype of the baby fat came six years earlier after Fat Farm wanted to expand into the women's market, offering a small line of women's t-shirts under Fat Fashion's LLC. After being presented with a prototype of a shirt, Kimura wasn't here for the basic athletic attire and decided to take on the role as creative director, drawing on her own experiences as a fashion model, conjuring up a collection better suited to represent what women actually would want to wear. Long and behold, the arrival of baby fat soon enough came to 
to fruition. Giving every ounce of city trends and boutique realness, designers paid no mind to Kimura's attempts at whatever she thought she was doing. No way could she compete with what the best of the designers and fashion brands were stirring up at the time. Starting off with low-rise jeans and tops adorned with a now-famous rhinestone cat logo inspired by Kimura's pet Siamese cat she had at the time named Max. Hot couture wasn't in her vision, but more so items that the everyday girl could wear. An exclusive brand solely for A-list celebrities to wear wasn't where she wanted to take the brand. In fact, she wasn't trying to keep up with the Joneses or the Kardashians at all. Baby Fat was a brand for women by women, more specifically the women of color who often were underrepresented and misrepresented in the media. More, more specifically, the black and brown women who may have not grown up in such privileged circumstances. In short, she wanted the brand to be ghetto fabulous AF and sought after the hood rich aesthetics. New York Fashion Week in the year 2000 would be Baby Fat's first introduction into the mainstream fashion occult. Streams live from its Radio City Music Hall venue, Kimura being the first designer to do so, all the way to the Jumbo Tin in Times Square, Baby Fat, like its big brother brand Fat Farm, was celebrated in all black everything. Well, minus the models. Black culture was loud and proudly present during the curation and execution of the line, resulting in its pigeonhole as an urban brand by fashion's elite. Similar to how Fat Farms cultivated its base following, Kimura was smart and used her husband's connections to the hip-hop community to attract a similar core audience. This attention to detail rallied some of rap's biggest names. From Lil' Kim to Foxy Brown, Kimura was able to not only garner the attention of the biggest A-listers around, sitting front row at Baby Fat's seasonal debuts, but also got them to support her brand and walk in her fashion shows, Naomi Campbell, Devin Aoki, and more recognizable names and faces being amongst the bunch. Doing away with asserting Baby Fat as a luxury name brand like Chanel, Gucci, or Louis Vuitton worked in Miss Lee's favor, opting for an aspirational lifestyle line that had turned into a brand encompassing denim pieces, accessories, and jewelry, and expanding into footwear, swimwear, fragrances, and even lingerie. In such a short time frame, the brand would go from being the underdog fashion line attempting to appeal to Hood America to one of the biggest brands spawned at the time. Merging high fashion with hip-hop helped so-called urban wear become a mainstream sensation and needless to say, the other communities didn't know what had hit them. Baby Fat didn't cater to the wealthy, uh palm-colored folks like how others had prioritized. Kimura didn't care about appealing to a broader audience or wanting a piece of everybody's coins. Baby Fat was her baby, and similar to her real babies, it was going to obtain similar traits that Kimura had herself, a little bit of class and a little bit of hooch. The birth of Baby Fat was solely due to women of color not having a voice within the streetwear industry, and Kimura, using her platform and expertise, wanted to give that voice to the voiceless. Just two years after its launch, Baby Fat grossed around $30 million in revenue. A milestone that took Russell's fat farm nearly six years to reach, and by 2002, its revenue leaped from $30 million to over $265 million, resulting in a billion-dollar valuation of the company. It had increased 30% in the following year. By 2003, Baby Fat by Kimora Lee Simmons was the most profitable of fat fashion's four labels. From Alita to Carrie Underwood, from the top celebrities to your homegirl and even your classmates, Baby Fat quickly took the trends by storm. Popping more than Lil Mama's lip gloss, it had expanded into several notable brand partnerships. A partnership with Visa to produce a prepaid Rush Visa card. A partnership with Motorola to create the i833 mobile bedazzled flip phone sold exclusively at Bloomingdale's. A partner with Vita Shoes International to create a shoe line which included stilettos, wedges, boots, and toddler shoes, and even opened its first brick and mortar retail location in New York City's Soho neighborhood. In that same year, Baby Fat partnered with Cody Inc. to launch Baby Fat Goddess, carried at department stores nationwide, and it would later be joined by five other fragrances. 2004 was a pivotal year for the brand and had also been the year Russell decided to sell his prestigious streetwear brand, Fat Farm, and all else attached to the Fat Fashions LLC to the Kelwood Company, including Baby Fat. Kimora, however, remained on board as president and creative director. The sale was intended to fund expansion to drive more promotional deals and build more stores. Another two years would go by and Baby Fat was still doing moderately well, upholding its crown as the queen of casual luxury fashion while competing with the likes of Juicy Couture, Van Dutch, and others. A presence in the Middle East was the next venture on the brand's list of achievements it wanted to knock out and by 2007 it did just that by opening a flagship store in Dubai, a first for any women's urban wear brand. 
By the time Y2K decade came to a finish, so did Kimura's contract with the Kelwood company. Kelwood had actually sold Fat Fashions to Sun Capital Partners after sales declined during the recession, and Kimura declined to renew her position with the company's new owners. Upon her exit, she made sure to retain ownership of all licensing rights to her fragrances and cosmetics collections. In 2007, she was presented with her own reality TV show on the style network Kimura Life in the Fab Lane, showing viewers a more close-up and personal side of the mogul, as well as her woes and adventures as mother to her babies, Ming and Aoki, and gave us an in-depth look at her entrepreneurship work with Baby Fat and her other fashion line, KLS. The show and her Baby Fat brand helped spread the message that Kimura intended to send, that women can be both mothers and moguls. Baby Fat offered an experience to female minorities who may not have had access to the world of fashion. Though it may not have been the first to bring forth streetwear to a more high-end designer aesthetic, it was the first streetwear brand to identify a female consumer base and cater to that with feminine styles of clothing that spoke directly to their culture. Its miniature baby doll tees, faux, evolved fur, puffer jackets, pastel velour tracksuits, amongst all else, were highly sought after and sealed with a stamp of approval by the one and only emblazoned signature rhinestone cat logo. Nine years after Kimura's departure from the fashion brand and as we started seeing that recognizable Siamese kitty less and less, on International Women's Day in 2019, Kimura announced the relaunch and subsequently the rebirth of her first baby, Baby Fat, and just like old times, when Ming and Aoki would accompany their mother after the end of each runway show, this time they'd be all hands on deck, chaperoning and governing the relaunch of Baby Fat with the help of Gen Z's knowledge. That first relaunch role came out with the help of Forever 21, and despite a few side eyes from original Fat fans, Baby Fat and Forever 21 sold out in less than 24 hours, letting it be known that Baby Fat was not only missed, but in much demand. A mini beauty collection and a partnership with Puma also came with its return. According to Kimura, Baby Fat's relaunch was much needed. Since the times of the early 2000s, the appropriation of black and urban cultures has been an ongoing debate, and honestly, not much has changed. It's in us. We subconsciously crave a time when the radio, magazines, and MTV were our connecting cultural forces. No matter your size or heritage, what united the baby fat girl was a desire to look good, feel great, and do it on a dollar. I was paying homage to the feminine, the materials, the finishings, the metals, and so on. The sizes and placements of the logo were really big, and they're looking really big nowadays too. Who would have thought that Ralph Lauren would have a logo on the chest that's the size of the palm of your hand? There was a time when someone would have mistakenly called that ghetto, but at that time it would have had a negative connotation. All I'm saying is to me, whatever it is labeled is not negative. Even though you may have seen that in the ghetto, you never would have said, oh, Ralph Lauren is ghetto. Even now for these other brands that are higher and the logos are huge and so are the sizes of the zippers, earrings, and stitch, what I was doing back then was something that was true to myself because that's where I was from. I didn't want to be called urban because I didn't understand what made me urban. It was only called that because of the color of the people wearing it and I thought that was some real racist crap. So back then, I was fighting the fight because I wanted to be included. It was fashion. Being the number one most sought after ticket, according to the New York Daily News, at New York Fashion Week can arguably establish baby fat as one of, if not the most culturally relevant brand of the early to late 2000s. Its urban yet feminine attributes caught the attention of some of the biggest designers in the industry and was loved by millions all around the world. Kimora Lee Simmons remains a synonymous staple to the Y2K era and Baby Fat will forever be a cultural renaissance tied to the aughts. Do you own any Baby Fat gear? Let us know your thoughts and opinions down below in the comments and stay tuned for more true celebrity stories.